Lord willing, we'll get through verses 1 through 6 this morning. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 5. One of the main points, and I suppose we could argue the main point that the author wants to really focus on in the book of Hebrews is the fact that Jesus is our high priest. And he wants to get there. He, he's been trying to get there through these first four chapters. And he's still trying to get there, but, but he kind of keeps taking, taking us down some different trails and getting a little sidetracked. It's kind of like if you ever watch that Disney movie, Up, there's a dog on there and he's going about his way. And every time a squirrel walks by, he goes, squirrel! And he's, he's, his, his attention's immediately turned and he, and he switches gears. Well, well, in a sense, that's kind of what the author of Hebrews is doing. He's, he's got all of this stuff he wants to say, and he begins saying one thing, and then he kind of, he kind of goes into something else, and then he, he gets back into the main topic. And that's what we've seen a lot. We've been seeing him kind of alluding to this point that he really wants to drive home. And he really won't get there until chapter 7. But he's continuing to prepare his reader for what he's really wanting to say. And what he's really wanting to talk to his audience about is about Jesus as the high priest. And we see that as early as, as verse 3, where it begins to talk about Jesus, the Son of God, as, as, as the one who makes atonement. Now, it doesn't speak of the high priest in that verse, but his audience, who was Jewish, would have understood that. There was one who made atonement for the people, and that was the high priest. And in the Old Testament, there was a priesthood that was established by God, and what the author of Hebrews wants us to know is that Jesus has become that high priest for us. And a better priesthood has arrived. And, and as we go through chapter 1 and then at the end of chapter 2, we see this idea that, hey, Jesus is a high priest who can sympathize with us and, and all of our weaknesses. He's been tested as we have been. And he's suffered as we have suffered. And, and he can relate to us. And then we see him again mention that. Uh, in chapter 4, he mentions the same idea that we do not have a high priest that is unable to sympathize with us. And so he's getting closer to making his point about the high priest. But even here in chapter 5, here he begins again. He begins to talk about the high priest, and kind of as soon as he gets started, he takes a break here at the end of the, the chapter to deal with something else. But, but we're going to get to a lot of talk about the high priest in chapter 7, but right now... It's kind of like if you ever ate a hamburger and the meat's too, too small and the bun's too big and you got to eat all the bread, it's like, this is too much bread, I want to just get to the meat. Well, maybe that's what this is kind of like. We, we, we're eating all the bread that's good for us and the lettuce and the tomatoes and we're tasting that, but we're like, well, there's some meat here somewhere and we're eventually going to get there and you get a little nibble of it and that's kind of what we're getting, but eventually we're going to get to the meat. Now, that's a pro tip here. When you're making hamburgers, make your meat patty big so it hangs <laughs> off the side. Make it twice as big as the buns that you have or buy smaller buns because nobody wants to, wants to eat just bread. But the bread's good for us. And so it's not that these things that we've been reading are not good for us. They are good for us. But, but he's, he's building us up to get into the, to the middle of the burger here, to get to the good stuff. And so we're continuing on with that. Today, So let's read through the text, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1, and then we'll pray. For every high priest taken from men is appointed in service to God for the people to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he must... Make a sin offering for himself as well as for the people. No one takes this honor on himself. Instead, a person is called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, the Messiah did not exalt himself to become a high priest. But the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father, also said in another passage, You are a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today and your word is good. There is so much good in this, God, and I pray that you would hide me behind the cross, that I would preach and teach in a way that brings your word out, God, that your Holy Spirit would be among us, that you would free us of distractions, dear Lord. 
that you would help our ears to be open to you, God, that you'd take away any fear or any pride that I have, dear Lord, that, that I would be humble before you today, that we would all be humble before you today and hear from you, God. We need you to speak to us, and you alone can speak to us, dear Lord, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would be among us, that your word would be good to us. Let us grow in your word today and grow in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Amen. It's hard for us sometimes when we read the Bible to really understand what we are reading because we're so far disconnected from the culture of that day. Now, for the audience that was reading this letter originally, they were a Jewish audience. They were well aware of the priesthood and the workings of the priesthood and what the priest did and why the priest did that. But this stuff to us is kind of far in it. It, we may not really understand exactly what's being said, and sometimes maybe we see stuff like this, and we say, oh yeah, the priest, well, that's probably kind of like a preacher today, but, but nothing whatsoever like a preacher today. I mean, maybe in some small areas there was some resemblance, but, but it's not like that the people got together every Sunday and went, and the high priest would preach a sermon, and, and that would be it. No, the, the, the high priest was the one who made atonement for the sins, and the, and the priesthood was established for the sacrifices of the animals so that the blood could be shed to cover the sins of the people. And this was a bloody job. This was a serious job that only a few were selected for. And, and of those few, Aaron was kind of the beginning of the priesthood, the brother of Moses. God appointed Aaron and said, look, through you, your descendants, y'all are going to be the high priest. And the, and the priestly people that did the priestly work came from the tribe of Levi. It was one tribe that was set apart to do the work of the priesthood. And, and you can read in the Old Testament, and there were lots of instructions for the priesthood and what they had to wear and how they had to carry out the things that God had called them to do. And, and there was the high priest that was the most important of all of the positions that God had appointed in the priesthood. And it was the high priest that would once a year would go into the most holy place, into the, into the tabernacle or into the temple, and would make atonement through sacrifice for the sins of the people. And so the job of the high priest was significant for the Jewish person. That's where their atonement came from. All the sins that had built up over the year, they would be atoned for, but they could only be atoned for by the high priest. And the author of Hebrews is really wanting to make this point. He's really wanting to drive this point home because he really wants his people to know that Jesus is the better high priest. Better than the high priest of the Old Testament, Jesus has come. A better priesthood has come through Jesus. And so we see him talking about that idea here in these passages. Now, we see in these verses that we just read several things that I guess we could say are qualifications or are part of being a high priest. One of those things is he is appointed by God. It is God who appoints those who are going to be priests. It's not a it's not a man-made position. It's not like there were a bunch of people running around with campaign signs saying, hey, brother, I'd appreciate your vote. I'm running for high priest this year, and I'll tell you what, I'll make sure not to forget an extra sacrifice on your behalf. That's not the way it worked. They're, the high priests were appointed by God, and for good reason. This was an important job. Now, we don't do too good at appointing people to be in leadership. You don't believe me, you look at the politics in our world. So praise the Lord that God didn't give this responsibility to us. But it is God who established the priesthood, and it is God who appoints those who are going to be our priests. So that's one thing we see in this passage, that it is God who appoints the high priest. The second is the high priest is appointed of men. God doesn't appoint angels to be high priests or anything else or animals to be high priests. God appoints man to be high priests. It is the high priest who is going to be the mediator between God and man. There's sinful man, and there's a perfect God, and there's sin in between us. And so God desires to atone for our sins so that we continue to be in relationship with him and we can continue to be his people. But the sins kept piling up every year, and there was the atonement every year. The next year, the sins would pile up, and there was the atonement. And, and God appointed a man, a human being, 
to be the one who was going to be the mediator between God and the people, that was going to be the representative, that was going to be the spokesman, that was going to be the one who stepped into the Holy of Holies and who offered the sacrifices. That was the job of the high priest. So he's appointed by God. He is a man who has been appointed by God for what purpose? For the purpose of of offering sacrifices. This was the key job of the high priest. He, he didn't go around the tabernacle. His job wasn't to make sure the water was turned off when it was, when it was wintertime coming, and it wasn't to make sure that there was plenty of bulletins around and, and all these other things sometimes that preachers may do and all that stuff in between preaching and checking on sick people. Nope. The primary job of the high priest was to offer sacrifices for the people. Now, this is a key thing that we need to understand about our sin and how, how, how horrible our sin is. And we touched on this in Sunday school this morning. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Why is that? Because the wages of sin is death. When sin occurs, the wages of sin is death. And so there has to be sacrifice. There has to be death. There has to be blood shed. Now, there's two ways that God could have dealt with this. One, he could have killed the sinner. He could kill you and I today. He could say, you are a sinner. The wages of sin is death, and therefore you have sinned. Death must occur and blood must be shed. That's one way that God could have dealt with sin. Praise the Lord, he didn't choose to deal with sin in that way. And so instead, he established a system. He established the priesthood. He established a high priest. And he said, okay, the high priest will be the one who sheds the blood of animals so that your sin can be atoned for. And this was a pretty good system. It was a pretty good system, but it was never going to be good enough. And God knew that. And so here we see the high priest appointed by God. He is a man so that he can, he can represent man and make atonement for man through the sacrifices to, that are to come. And the fourth thing that we see here about the high priest is that he is sympathetic. He can deal gently with the people, it says, because he is a sinner. And as he made sacrifices for the people, he first made sacrifices for himself and made sacrifices for the people because he himself was a sinner and he could deal gently with the people. Now, when we begin to talk about Jesus is the high priest, Jesus was not a sinner. But nonetheless, Jesus can deal gently with us and he can sympathize with us because he has suffered in every way just as you and I have, yet he is without sin. So Jesus can certainly sympathize with us today and be gracious to us today. And we talked about that last week. And this is a point that we have seen throughout the last five chapters that the author of Hebrews wants his audience to know is that Jesus sympathizes with you, that Jesus understands what you have gone through. And because of the victory of Jesus, there can be a better atonement for you. There can be grace that can come for you. And so the job of the high priest was significant. The author of Hebrews wants his audience to know that Jesus is a better high priest. Now, what makes Jesus a better high priest? Well, what makes Jesus a better high priest is that Jesus offered a better sacrifice. Now, the old high priest in the priesthood would offer the, uh, the different animals that God would say, okay, do this and do that and sprinkle this blood and do this in this way. But when Jesus came, one, he was appointed by God. Now, this was, this was significant. This is one of those things that, that you really need to kind of have some knowledge of the Old Testament and some understanding to realize why he's saying this. Why is he saying, hey, Jesus was appointed by God? Well, surely his audience knew that God is the one who appointed the priesthood, but there was one big problem with Jesus being a high priest and referred to as a high priest, and that was Jesus wasn't a Levite. In the Old Testament, the priesthood came from the Levites, from the descendants of Aaron. They were to be the high priest, but Jesus didn't come from the tribe of Levi. 
Instead, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. So this would have been probably a stumbling block for some of his audience. Now, we read it and we say, oh, you know, yeah, Jesus is a high priest. I get that. But, but you have to think about the audience that's being written to. Here, these are people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, and they're being tempted through suffering and persecution. They're wanting to go back to the old way. And maybe this was a way they were justifying it. Maybe they were thinking, oh, wait a minute, we follow this Jesus, but, but he's from the child of Judah, so, so maybe he's not a high priest that we need to be following. And maybe that's why the author of Hebrews addressed this and brought this up, that, hey, just so you know, Jesus has been appointed by God. Now, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, and there were no priests that were supposed to come from the tribe of Judah. Now, a king could come from the tribe of Judah, but not a priest. And so Jesus is quite unique in his priesthood. And yet the author of Hebrews reminds his audience here, Jesus has been appointed by God. What's the other qualification that we saw there we talked about earlier? Is that men are the one who are appointed to be the priest, to be the representative of the people, to make atonement for the people. And so here's Jesus, the Son of God who came in the flesh, 100% man in every way as you and I are, and it is Jesus Christ who is our mediator. Let me read a scripture to you right quick. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, Christ Jesus himself, human. Now, this talks about what we've just talked about. One, there is one God. We need to make sure we know that today. Maybe you came into this room and you think there are multiple gods out there. There are not. There is one God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. That is the God that we come, whose word we read today. This is the God that we are seeking in this building today. There is but one God. And what else does that passage tell us? There is but one God mediator between God and man. Now, some people will say, okay, well, there's one God, but there's lots of different ways that we can get to God. That's not true. There are not lots of different ways that we can get to God. There is nobody else representing us. There is nobody else atoning for us. It's not like God said, okay, well, I'm going to send Jesus, and there's going to be some people that will follow him, but I'm going to have another way over here. And if you do this and do that and act this way and say these things, then, then if you, you meet these qualifications, you can get in too. Nope, that's not the way that God worked. There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man. And he was the Son of God who took on flesh as a human, as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's interesting that he points out Jesus, who was the Son of God, the mediator, who was human. He was a man, as the high priesthood was, people, uh, men who had been appointed by God. And he is the one mediator between us and God. And why is it that he is the one mediator? Because he is the one who made the sacrifice. He is the one who made the atonement for our sins. Because he is the only one who is perfect and sinless. He is the only one who is obedient to God in every way. He is the only one that has succeeded in every way that we has failed. And therefore, Jesus is the only high priest who is qualified to make the perfect atonement for your sin and for my sin. And there is but one mediator between man and God today, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, we may think we can attempt to earn God's favor and, and, and work our way into heaven by some other means, but I'll tell you today, if your sin has not been atoned for by Jesus Christ, your sins have not been forgiven. There's nobody else that can, that can represent you, that can atone for you, that can mediate before you in the eyes of God. There's no one else who has taken all of your sin and been nailed to a cross and crucified, that God resurrected from the dead, who now sits at the right hand of God other than Jesus. He is our high priest, and he is a far better high priest than those that we saw in the Old Testament. And so the author of Hebrews is dealing with the struggle that his audience has with, wait a minute, why is this high priest important? Why don't we just go back to the old priesthood? Wait a minute, this, this guy, 
He's not even from the tribe of Levi. But as he continues to make the case, he continues to make the point by referencing a verse that we saw him reference earlier in the book. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5 says, In the same way, the Messiah did not exalt himself to become a high priest, but the one who said to him, You are a, my son, today I have become your father. Now, we saw that verse earlier in the book. We saw him use this same verse back or that, that he quoted. This is um, Psalm 2-7 right here that he's quoting from. We saw him use this back in chapter 1 where he talks about Jesus being the Son of God. And what does he say in this verse? The one who said to him, You are my son. He's establishing this point that there is something significant about Jesus. In chapter 1 and chapter 2, it was that Jesus is better than the angels. Why? Because he is the Son of God, the Son of God who was appointed for this task of high priest. And again, he goes back to this same passage, and he says, hey, the same one that said this passage, he's talking about Jesus. This is the one that we're talking about. The one who appoints the priesthood is the one who appointed Jesus, and is the one who said, you are my son. And what does he say? Today I have become your father, signifying that there was some day. Now, it's interesting to think about what that day is. Obviously, Jesus is eternal. He's, he's been forever. Is it, is it that one day Jesus wasn't, and then he was born, and that was the day that's being spoken of? Well, I don't think so. That would really make sense with the rest of Scripture. But perhaps what he's saying, and this is just one thought, perhaps this is incorrect, but perhaps the day that he's speaking of is the day of Jesus Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. That day solidified. That day brought everything together. All that God had said was going to take place had all built up to, to, to Jesus dying on the cross. And once Jesus had completed his mission, it was official. His job was done. He was the high priest. He was the son of God. And he was faithful unto death. He was completely obedient. On this day, you have become my son. On this day, you have become the king of kings. On this day, you have become the Lord of lords. And what day is that? It was the day that Jesus Christ was crucified and resurrected. And the author of Hebrews said, look, it is God who appoints the high priest, and it is God who has called this high priest his son. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, also, said in another passage, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, we're not going to touch on that too much today because that's a whole other topic that we're going to delve into in a lot of detail when we get to chapter 7. But the author of Hebrews will see as we continue this chapter and make our way into chapter 7, we'll see that Melchizedek is an important figure from the author of Hebrews. And some of you are saying, Mel who? Some of you are saying, I had never heard that name in my life. I don't have a clue what he's talking about. Well, study it this week, or we're going to get to it here in, a, in a, probably a month or so. But Melchizedek is an important character. And it's interesting that the author of Hebrews spends so much time on the character of Melchizedek because he's mentioned very, very briefly in Scripture. Now, here he's quoting from Psalm 110, which, if I'm not mistaken, is, is quoted from more in the New Testament than any Old Testament passage, Psalm 110. It's a, it's a beautiful little short passage, and he's quoting from Psalm 110 right here when he mentions Melchizedek. So that's one reference to Melchizedek we see in the Old Testament. But we also see Melchizedek early on in the book of Genesis. And here this character that we only we see mentioned very briefly in the Old Testament, know very little about, and yet that is the one that the author of Hebrews is calling his audience back to. And why is he calling his audience back to Melchizedek? Well, we'll talk about that when the time comes. But what, what the author is doing here is he's trying to establish that Jesus' priesthood is better. And with the priesthood comes better atonement through what Jesus has to offer. It's better atonement. Because in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the atonement for sins was insufficient in some way. There had to be a better priesthood that would come. If you want to turn with me to Numbers chapter 15, Numbers chapter 15, 
going to read kind of a, a big section here. We won't break it down verse by verse, but we'll start in verse 22. Numbers chapter 15, verse 22. We'll read through verse 31. This is God giving instruction to the people about their sins and about the atonement that is to be given by the high priest. Listen carefully as we read Numbers chapter 15, starting in verse 22. When you sin unintentionally and do not obey all these commands that the Lord spoke to Moses, all that the Lord has commanded you through Moses, from the day the Lord issued the commands and onward throughout your generations, and if it was done unintentionally, without the community's awareness, the entire community is to prepare one young bull for a burnt offering as a pleasing aroma to the Lord with its grain offering and drink offering according to the regulation and one male goat as a sin offering. The priests must then make atonement for the entire Israelite community so that they may be forgiven for the sin was unintentional. They are to bring their offering, one made by fire to the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their unintentional sin. The entire Israelite community and the foreigner who resides among them will be forgiven, since it happened to all the people unintentionally. If one person sins unintentionally, he is to present a year-old female goat as a sin offering. The priest must then make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the person who acts in error, sinning unintentionally. And when he makes atonement for him, he will be forgiven. You are to have the same law for the person who acts in error, whether he is an Israelite or a foreigner who lives among you. But the person who acts defiantly, whether native or foreign resident, blasphemes the Lord. That person is to be cut off from his people. He will certainly be cut off because he has despised the Lord's word and broken his commands. His guilt remains on him. Now that's a lot to think about there, but there was probably one word you may have noticed that I said a lot in that passage. In my translation, it was unintentional. This whole passage talks about the, 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 the forgiveness of unintentional sins and the sacrifice for unintentional sins and the atonement for unintentional sins. And that's one of those verses you're reading it and it's like, all right, I get that part. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, but there are some things that I have done that I know outright are sins against God. And I'm waiting for the part that he talks about the atonement for the intentional defiant sins against God. But it doesn't get there, does it? It says for those who have sinned unintentionally, there is atonement that can be made. But what does it say? For those who have sinned, knowing that they have sinned defiantly against God, he says they must be cut off from the people. Now, he don't just mean like, like send them out. You got to go live over there. You can't. No, you are to kill them. You are to be cut off from the people. The wages of sin is death. Yeah, there are some sins that sneak up on you that are unintentional, you're not aware of, you don't, you're not sure, you kind of do it on accident, it sneaks up on you. But there are other sins that we do defiantly against God. And in the Old Testament law, it says for those sins that were unintentional, there is atonement that can be made. And boy, I remember when I first read that, I, I, it jumped out to me and I said, all right, well, I'm going to get in the next chapter or two, we're going to get to the part where it talks about the intentional sins and the defiant sins. And I kept reading and I ain't got to that part. Now, some would argue that there are a few verses that may say that even intentional sin could be forgiven in the Old Testament, but I don't know that there are any that are clear, at least not to me, perhaps to you. What is clear that there was, there was atonement for unintentional sin, but it seems pretty clear right here that sins that are intentional, there was no atonement for. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty scary thing. What does that mean for us? Is there any hope for us in our intentional sin? Because the fact of the matter is that everybody sitting in this room, we've sinned greatly against God. 
There have been things that we have known were sinful that God has told us not to do, and we have done it. Some would say that's what's referred to as high-handed sin. God, I know this is sin, but I don't care, God. I'm going to do this sin. Now, in the Old Testament law, there doesn't seem to be much hope. But praise the Lord, I've got good news for you today. I wouldn't even preach this message if there wasn't any good news. If I'd have just read that passage and there wasn't any hope, I'd have said, I can't preach anymore. But I can preach today because there's hope in Jesus Christ, because there is a better priesthood that can make atonement for our sins. And even in the Old Testament, when there was nothing in the law to make atonement for sins, God was gracious. Now, one of the greatest stories, I think, that's the exa best example of this in all the Old Testament is the story of King David, who was a man after God's own heart. And there he was in the palace looking out, and what did he see on the rooftop but a beautiful woman who was bathing? And he said, bring that woman to me. And there David took that woman, and that woman became pregnant, and David knew full well the law of God. I don't believe that was an unintentional sin. I don't believe that slipped up on David. And somebody said to David one day, hey, you know that's wrong. Whoa, I didn't know that. David knew full well that he had sinned. And not only did he know that he had sinned, but to cover up a sin, he said, this woman's pregnant. What am I going to do now? He said, her husband, I got to get him home. He's off at battle. He's off fighting. I need to get him home real quick so he'll come and be with his wife so when the child comes, nobody will think anything of it. And Uriah, being a good man, he didn't go with his wife. He said, look, all my friends are out there uh, uh, battling on the battlefield. How can I go home and be comfortable? And David said, man, what am I going to do? So David said, well, here's what I'll do. I'll send him back on the front lines. He sent a letter to the commander and said, Hey, when Uriah gets back, I want you to put him where the fighting is the worst on the front line. Now, what do you think happens to people who are on the front line? They die. Now, you, David knew full well what he was doing. He had sinned against God by, by being with Bathsheba. And now to cover up his sin, he says, I'm going to send her husband to the fiercest spot on the battlefield so that he will die. And who was guilty of the murder of Uriah? It was David who was guilty of the murder of Uriah. So here is David, a man after God's own heart who had sinned greatly and who had sinned intentionally. And the prophet Nathan came before David and told him a, a story that got David's attention and talked about a guy in the story that wasn't doing right. And, and David said, well, that's horrible. That, that guy, he needs to be punished for what he's done. And Nathan said, David, that guy is you. You are the one who have sinned against God in such a great way. And oh, David knew when he heard those words. He knew that he had sinned against God. And in 2 Samuel chapter 15, 2 Samuel chapter, excuse me, uh, chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Then Nathan replied to David, The Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. Wait a minute. What's going on here? We didn't see any atonement for intentional sin, so we can either say, well, David's sin was unintentional, or we can say that there's something else at play here. There's something better than what the law offered here. And what God offers to David here is grace. Now, many times people will say, oh, well, there's two different gods. There's God of the Old Testament, there's God of judgment, there's God of the law, and then in the New Testament, there's a God of grace. That is not true. The grace of God is all throughout the pages of the Old Testament, time and time again. And yes, God gave a system, he gave a priesthood, he gave sacrifices, but those sacrifices were never going to be sufficient, and so he brought about a better priesthood who would bring about a better atonement that could 
could cover the sins that would come after him and that could cover the sins of people like David who had come before because the blood of Jesus is able to forgive the sins of all who would seek him. And even though David didn't know exactly about the Messiah that come, we see through the writings of the psalm that David knew something. Even though he hadn't seen the Messiah, he knew of the Messiah. He trusted in God and he was a man of sin, but he was a man who received the grace of of God. And that atonement that allows the grace of God to occur in the life of David and in the life of you and I today comes from a better priesthood because in the Old Testament there was no sacrifice that was sufficient. There was no sacrifice that was good enough, but God's grace was still good, but grace is not free. God can't just give out grace. I'll give this grace out and that grace out. God can't just give that grace out unless it has been paid for. And grace came at a price. And Jesus paid that price by being a ransom for all. So grace is possible for us today and mercy is possible for us today because of what Jesus Christ, our high priest, has done on our behalf. He has made atonement for our sins. He has stood between us and God and he has says, God, I will cover the one who trusts in me. God, I know this one. This one is mine and I have covered their sins. I have atoned for them. And that is why Jesus is a better high priest for us today. And it's through Jesus that grace comes to us through the Lord. We see in John chapter 1 verses 16 and 17, indeed we have all received grace after grace from his fullness for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Everything we see in the Old Testament was but a shadow of what was coming to Jesus. It was but a shadow of what was to come. Yeah, God established the law and he established these things in the Old Testament and they showed kind of a, a, a glimpse of how God wanted things, but they were always insignificant. They were never going to be good enough, but they were pointing us forward to one who would, who would carry out the things in the way that God wanted. And that one is Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, when David was forgiven, some of the most beautiful words, I think, in all of Scripture, Psalm 51. It's a psalm that as we read the superscription of it, it's attributed to David writing this psalm after the events that we just talked about, after David's sin. And David knew full well that there was no sacrifice that he could give to God to cover for his sins. And in Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17, he says, You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and humble heart. There was no sacrifice that David could offer to atone for his sin. And there's no sacrifice that you and I today can offer to atone for our sin. But praise the Lord that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, atoned for our sin on the cross. He suffered and he bled and he died so that your sins and my sins could be forgiven. Oh, what a glorious hope we have today to know that there are some rotten things that we have done in defiance of God and we know those things are sinful. What an amazing and beautiful thing that Jesus said, I will die for those sins. I will die to make atonement for you. And we receive that atonement when we get to the place that David was at in Psalm 51. When we drop to our knees, when we cry out to God and say, God, there's nothing I can give to you. There's nothing I can do for you, dear Lord. There's no sacrifice that is sufficient. If that was true, we'd give a thousand sacrifices, but there's nothing today that you can do to earn God's favor and earn God's forgiveness. But what God desires of us is a humble heart. God says, I've provided the atonement. I've provided the sacrifice in my son. I've provided the high priest who offered the sacrifice that was his very life. God says, I have done everything for you, but what God calls us to is to repent of our sins. Not keep living in sin, knowing it's sinful, but to recognize our sin and say, God, I humbly come before you and I repent of my sin. And that's what's pleasing to God. When we repent of our sin and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, oh, what a beautiful day that is to recognize that Jesus as our high priest has offered a perfect sacrifice on our behalf.
He's offered his blood. I hope today that each one of you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We thank you for these good words. And God, it's kind of a lot for us as we read through books like Hebrews because he kind of jumps around. He talks about stuff that, that are kind of, kind of strange to us that we don't, we don't quite understand. And it's a lot of repetition and, and it's a lot of stuff in there, dear Lord. But God, I pray that above all, for all the things that, that might not quite make sense to us, that Jesus would make sense to us. That, that when we shuck it down, dear Lord, at its core, what the author of Hebrews is saying to us is that Jesus is better. Dear Lord, Jesus is better than everything in our life. He's better than our religion. He's better than our sin, dear Lord. Praise God. We thank you for that. Dear Lord, there are some today that, are, that perhaps are trying to earn your favor by their actions, by their deeds, by the way that they live. God, maybe, maybe they're trying to atone for their own sin by, by doing good things, dear Lord. But we cannot atone for our sin, dear Lord. There is no one in this world we can go to to atone for our sins. There is only one who can atone for our sins, and that is Jesus Christ. God, I thank you that you sent your son to die on a cross. I thank you that he was faithful unto death, dear Lord, knowing full well that the sins of just the people in this room today were overwhelming, dear Lord. But yet he took them. God, I pray that if there is one in here today that's struggling with sin, that they would give it to you, that they would repent of that, dear Lord. Maybe there's some today and, and they struggle with the sin of their past and they've repented and they ask forgiveness maybe a hundred times over, but there's no peace. God, I pray that they would find peace knowing that the atonement of Jesus Christ is sufficient and it's covered, dear Lord. That when we come to you with a humble heart, that what Jesus done has covered our sins. And so, God, I pray that if there's one who is struggling with the sin of the past today, that they would find freedom from that. If there's one from struggling from sin in the present, dear Lord, that they would give it to Jesus Christ today. God, maybe there's some that do not know Jesus. Maybe there's some today whose sins have never been covered, have not been atoned for. I pray, God, today they would know that there is no other mediator between God and man. They would know that there is no other forgiveness than through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So, God, we thank you. We thank you for sending a better high priest. And, God, I pray that just as this Hebrew audience was tempted to turn to something else for their salvation, God, that, that we would not be tempted in such a way. That if there are some in this room today that are tempted to turn to something else in this world that are trying to find peace and salvation and, 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 and whatever it may be in this world, dear Lord, that they would know the world can't give it but that your son, Jesus Christ, has already given it on the cross. So I pray, God, that if there are any in this room that don't know you today, that they would. If there are any in this room that are struggling today, dear Lord, that maybe they're yours, maybe they just need to repent. God, I pray that as we sing this song, that if you've spoken to anybody today, that they would respond. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. <laughs>